Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Scripture Snippets. We are continuing our study into the book of Revelation. Uh, We have just ended uh, the first uh, three chapters of the book, uh, beginning with the introduction and then Christ's letter to the seven churches, which as we were taught were seven literal churches of Asia Minor, but also what we need to remember from this point going forward is that those seven letters uh, not only were seven literal churches, not only did they tell us what Christ expects of the church and what Christ doesn't want to see in the church, but it also gave us a panoramic view of the history of the church age, uh, because the church age is definitely a dispensation uh, that we have to understand, and Christ is working with his church in a certain way, and we can thematically see uh, it here in chapter 4 as we begin chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. Uh, We're going to be uh, talking about the the throne room of heaven here. Uh, This chapter, uh, John is going to be raptured up into heaven, and we're going to see the appearance uh, of the throne room, uh, the very throne of God. Uh, So let's begin in verse number 1. John writes these things. He says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Okay, I want you to notice that the door. Remember, Christ called himself the door. Uh, when we do, when we look at Noah's Ark and the importance of the door, that God shut the door. So we see another illustration here, another beautiful thing for us to remember. But he saw a door standing open. So Christ is welcoming him up into heaven. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Again, let's remember, those who know Jesus know his voice and follow him. And that's the voice of the trumpet, the sound here. And then verse number two, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Okay, verse number two. Let's look at this again. He says, Immediately I was in the Spirit. Uh, In in this translation that I'm reading here, uh, the New King James Spirit is capitalized, representing that that Greek word there is specifically speaking of the member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so it was. it's God himself who raptures believers. It's not some mystical force. It's not some mystical draw. It's God himself. Jesus Christ, God himself, you know, when Enoch uh, was raptured up in the Old Testament, God the Father uh, raptured him. And here we see uh, this, uh, Jesus Christ raptures believers at the time of the rapture. And here we see that the Holy Spirit actually was the one that raptured John into heaven. And he said, And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and one is capitalized, saying, And it's only Christ who has that. Uh, God the Father uh, gave uh, the Son the throne, ordained him to the throne, and he is there. Uh, Verse number three, And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Uh, The jasper and the sardius stone represents that priestly hood, that priestly uh, hood. Uh, we, 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 see, we read of those stones back in the Old Testament. Uh, he, it's representative of him being our high priest and being in a place of an authority, as being a representative and being in a place of authority, having that high seat. And look at there, it says, and there was a rainbow around the throne. Now, the rainbow, which has been hijacked lately, but the rainbow was very important. It was at a promise from God. And it was a shot. It was a, a, a showing, uh, a sign, of God's grace and His mercy. If you remember, the rainbow was given to Noah after the flood as a promise by God, as a covenant that He would no longer uh, destroy the world uh, through a global flood. It was a promise that God made, and it was also a reminder of His mercy and His grace because He did preserve mankind. God didn't have to preserve mankind, but yet He did. Uh, through Noah and his family. And that should uh, tell us that we have a loving and a redeeming God, uh, one who's gracious and merciful. Uh, So even that rainbow uh, around the throne uh, symbolizes us, and it's there for us to remember his covenant, to remember his mercy, and to remember his grace. 
an appearance like an emerald, uh, precious as can be, uh, a rarity and very valuable. Verse number four. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Now some people uh, look at these 24 elders, and um, we know they're redeemed. What we can say positively is that these are redeemed believers. These are believers uh, who have been given the right to sit uh, next to Christ. They have been, and we get that promise. We get that promise that as believers, one day we will rule with him, that we'll be given crowns based upon uh, what we did here on this earth and in and, and, and certain things. Some of us will receive a crown of righteousness. Others will receive different crowns. Um, but, but we will receive that, and we will rule with Christ in there. So, so that's encouraging, and we know these people are redeemed. I personally believe uh, that these 24 elders is even more representative. Uh, and it's with that number 12, uh, the 24. Uh, divided by 2 is 12. Uh, in the Old Testament, it, where God moved, and God's plan was revealed to the nations, uh, we had the promise of the Messiah from the very beginning of creation, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, the seed of the woman. Uh, we see it there. We see uh, through uh, the life and the faith of Abraham. Uh, we see it through even Moses and his declarations. Uh, we see it in uh, the signs uh, that Moses set up with when it came to the, the high priest. When we look at the tabernacle and the setup and stuff, everything pointed towards Christ. Even the sacrifices itself. Uh, the prophets declared the coming Messiah. Uh, we see David and the others pointing, uh, pointing the way to Jesus Christ. Uh, but how was the Old Testament? What was, you say, how was the number 12 representative of the Old Testament? Uh, the tribe of Israel, God's people. Uh, God remains faithful to that. Uh, he has not dismissed Israel. He has not given up on Israel. Uh, there, there is a theology out there that tries to do a replacement uh, theology and says that Israel doesn't matter anymore, uh, but it does. Israel's is God's people. Uh, God is an unchanging God, and he's still faithful to his people to this day. So I believe that those 12 uh, represent, uh, they may not be necessarily like uh, 12 high priests. Uh, they could be, but they're 12 representatives, and I believe they represent each one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And you say, well, how about the other 12? Because it says there's 24. Uh, the best 12 uh, that fit in a representative of the church. And that's the disciples, the apostles, the twelve apostles. Uh, now some who would argue this point of view uh, will bring up the fact that John is seeing this, and John is one of the apostles. Uh, however, what we do know of John in his writings is John is very humble. Uh, John would not necessarily come out and proclaim uh, that he's one of those. Uh, even in his gospel, he, he kept referring to himself um, as the one he loved. He would never declare his own personal name uh, when he very well could have. He, he very well could have, but he didn't. Uh, John remained humble. So I have, and like I said, all that we know for sure is that these are redeemed individuals who are ruling with the Lord, who who sit there alone. Of course, all ruling and all judgment comes from Jesus Christ himself, uh, but God uh, allows them to be in his heavenly court, and we see them be beside his throne, and these are definitely redeemed individuals. But I do believe uh, that 12 of them represent each of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, representing that fulfillment of the Old Testament era, and then the other 12 represent the church age. Uh, those 12 disciples who established um, the very beginning of the church and who Christ loved very much and took as his own. All right, let's go on. Verse number five, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Thun lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Uh, not nothing to be scared of, but that talks about his majesty. Uh, we should have a heavenly fear, uh, 
we, it is terror. It is uh, full of terror, uh, lightnings, thunderings, and voices, but it's one of majesty, one of power, and one of might. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, some people may wonder what this is. The seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, this refers to the seven eyes of the Lord, or the characteristics of God, that we read about. Um, if You need to go back into Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, and you can read about there, and you can hear some, uh, some of the characteristics. And it's spoken again in Isaiah chapter 11, uh, verse number 2. Um, it refers to, uh, again, the characteristics of God. So it testifies to that. Verse number 6. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. A sea of glass. Uh, the description of the sea in heaven and around the throne, uh, it suggests a calmness and tranquility, uh, which is very much in turmoil of what John is about to see. He's about to see uh, saints martyred. Uh, he's about to see... Uh, the judgment of God upon the face of the earth. He's about to see terrors unspeakable, which had never happened uh, until this time. Uh, but yet, before the throne, before the very presence of Jesus Christ, it's like a calming sea of glass. You know, when sailors are out in the ocean, and when they talk about how it was like glass, uh, it's a calm and, and peaceful time. It's not a tumultuous waves or a time of storm, but that sea of glass is what you want, what you want uh, because it's calm. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes, front and back. What are these four living creatures? We've ran into them before. Uh, if you read uh, again into the book of Ezekiel, into the book of Isaiah, uh, you learn about the seraphim. These are the seraphim which were before the throne, the same ones that Ezekiel saw. Uh, verse number 7, the first living creature was like a lion, uh, and the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature like a face, had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Uh, the four living creatures, each having six wings, again the seraphim here, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, but they continue saying, or it says saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Let's break that down because that's a... Oh, I love that. And I love the fact, and I cannot wait until I'm in heaven with my Lord. And I pray that maybe that I'm blessed to be at his feet. And that's all I say from here to the eternity. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, 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 why three times? Represents the three persons of the Trinity. Holy is the Father. Holy is the Son. Holy is the uh, ho Holy Spirit. They are holy. All three persons get equal glory, for they are equal, each person. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, three in one, who was and is and is to come. Christ was here on this earth, he was there in eternity. He was there at creation. He was there in eternity past. He was ever-present. He is. He's still alive today. He's ruling today. He's existent today and is to come. He, he, he will come. He will establish his kingdom uh, again here on this earth. He will uh, arrive in Armageddon, and he will take over, and he'll reign uh, triumphantly here on this earth. Verse number 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. What's the response? What's the response when we hear these creatures, when we hear that, when we hear 
Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is, is to come. The only response for those that are redeemed, these 24 elders, is to, is to bow down uh, to the very face of Christ and to proclaim that he is worthy. That's worship. Again, the word worship actually when it comes from a term worth-ship, to show that something is worthy, to give a, a feeling of worth to someone or something. And that's what we're doing here. They're giving, uh, they're proclaiming the worth of the Lord. They're saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. And they recognize that he has created all things. And that the whole reason why we exist is because of the will of God himself, the will of Christ himself. The 24 elders who represent the redeemed in heaven acknowledge that God created humans for his good pleasure. Uh, Their response of praise recognizes the sovereignty of God over our lives. And that's how chapter 4 ends. And what a beautiful way for that to end. For we see the beauty of the throne of God. And that's how it's going to be in heaven. That's how that very throne is going to be. It's going to be a calming place to go. That sea of glass. And then it's going to be a place for the redeemed from all of eternity, from those in the Old Testament who hold to the faith in the Messiah, to to those of the very church. It's going to be a place where all of us and the angelic beings where we'll worship together as one. Do you see that? You see the 12 of the Old Testament, because like I said, I like to think of that. I'm just saying these 24 are redeemed. I don't know this for sure. But I kind of like to think of that because you have the 12 representatives of the Old Testament who are there at the very beginning of the plan of God. You you have the 12 of the church, the established church, those that were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, those who were established by Him, those who, who, who continued His work. So you have the fulfillment of those that were in mankind. But then you have a union because we're there with angelic beings. We're there with the seraphim. And what do all three entities do? They worship God. They worship and they recognize that none of them, whether it be the angelic beings, whether it be the Old Testament saints or the New Testament saints, none of us would ever be there if it hadn't been for the sovereign decision of God to allow us to live, to allow us to even exist. And it's for his pleasure and his pleasure alone. And what a way to think of the throne of God and the majesty. And it's Jesus Christ who sits upon the throne, the voice like a trumpet. Gives me goosebumps just thinking about it, thinking about the throne. So that's uh, Revelation chapter 4. We're going to begin Revelation chapter 5 next, uh, which is a very uh, honoring chapter to our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, But it begins uh, a time of great judgment upon the earth as we're going to learn about the seven seal scroll and who is going to be worthy. The question is asked, who is worthy to open the scroll? And we will begin that in the next episode. Stay strong, stay faithful. Go ahead and read ahead in the book of Revelation, and I hope to catch you in the next podcast.